The Story of Salt, The Amazing Role of Salt in the World, written by Mark Kurlansky and S.D. Schindler, published by Puffin Books. My Rock. It began a few years ago with a rock I bought in a small mountain town in Spain. The rock had pink surfaces with streaks of white and brown. Though it was not a diamond or an emerald or a ruby, it was beautiful. Yet, it was only salt. I took my rock home and I put it on a windowsill. One day, it got rained on and the white crystals started appearing on the pink. My beautiful pink rock was now starting to look like white salt, and that seemed very ordinary. So I rinsed the crystals off the rock with water. Then for 15 minutes, I carefully patted the rock dry with a towel. When I woke up the next day, the rock was pink again, but it was sitting in a puddle of salt water that had leaked out of it. The sun was heating the water, and after a few hours, square white crystals began to appear. This is called solar evaporation and is the exact way the ocean water is turned into salt. For a while, it seemed I had a magical stone that would continually produce salt water. The rock never seemed to get smaller. Sometimes I thought the rock had completely dried out, but then on a humid or rainy day, another puddle would appear under it. I decided to experiment and dry the rock out by baking it in a toaster oven. Within a half hour, I saw it had grown stalactites, long, thin tentacles of white crystals drooping down from the toaster grill. I brushed them off with my, brushed them off, and my rock looked the same as before. My rock lived by its own rules. When friends came over, I would show them the rock and tell them that it was salt. They would always ask to lick it, to see if it was true. My rock was only salt, which we sprinkled on our food every day without a thought. But the simple common thing, salt, or NaCl, as it is known chemically, has been the object of wars and revolutions. It has fascinated people and preoccupied econo economies since before recorded time. What is salt? The earth is made up of 92 natural elements, which combine in nature to form compo compounds. Salt is a compound produced when sodium, Na, a metal so unstable that it easily burst into flames, combines with chlorine, Cl, a deadly poisonous gas. This natural occurrence is known as a chemical reaction. Think of it as two people who misbehave on their own but play well together. The two elements stabilize each other, and the resulting compound, sodium chloride, is neither explosive nor poisonous. This is what we call salt. Salt is the only rock eaten by human beings. In fact, all mammals, including humans, need to eat salt, oh, sodium chloride, in order to live. Sodium chloride is needed for breathing and for digestion, and without salt, the body could not transport nourishment, oxygen, or nerve impulses, which means that the body would not function at all. A healthy adult body contains about 250 grams of salt, which would fill three large shakers. Our body continually loses salt through bodily functions, and the supply needs to be continuously replenished. How to make salt. The four most common ways to find salt in nature are on the ground in dry salt beds in the oceans in underground springs, and in rocks under the earth. Humans first found salt on the surface of land, 
where ancient salt lakes had dried up. Animals, who need even more salt than people, were usually the first to discover these places, sometimes called salt licks because animals would go lick the, sal lick the salty ground. When humans wanted to gather this salt, they simply scraped it up from the ground. The most plentiful source of salt is in the oceans, but seawater must be boiled for many hours before the water has evaporated and only salt is left. This is the very expensive way to produce salt because a great deal of fuel, such as wood or coal, must be burned up. The fuel may be more valuable than the salt. One solution is to enclose the seawater in man-made ponds at the edge of the ocean and let, it, let the heat in the sun. This is a very slow process. The, pound, the ponds can take more than a year to evaporate to salt crystals, but both the salt and the sunlight are free. Salt is also found in underwater springs. In 200 BC, a man named Li Bing, the governor of Sichuan Providence in, China, in central China, discovered that springs of salt water came from under the earth. Because this water is usually saltier than the oceans, it does not take as much time or fuel to boil it into the salt. To get to the springs, the Chinese began drilling into the earth by pounding on long iron chisels. Then long bamboo tubes were lowered on ropes into the holes to scoop up the salty water. The work could be dangerous. Some of the workers drilling the holes would get sick. Sometimes flames would spit out of the hole. Occasionally a tremendous explosion would erupt and kill an entire crew. With no other explanation at hand, the people of Sichuan concluded that there were dragons under the earth guarding the precious salt. However, by AD 100, they came to understand that there was an invisible substance in the holes that would travel up the pipes. The pipes led to the house where the salt water was boiled. The workers learned to light the end of the pipe where the fumes came out to produce a flame that could heat the pots of salt water to boil out the salt. This is the earliest known use of natural gas in the world. Another source of salt is rocks that are mined under the ground. These are large rock salt deposits in many parts of the United States, including Louisiana and Texas. Rock salt is mined under Cleveland and Detroit today. Most rock salt is extremely pure. Once miners turn on the lights, each salt mine looks unique. Some have black or gray walls, and others are so white they look like a snowstorm just passed through. Some have white stripes, while others, such as the mine in Car uh, Cardonia in northern Spain, have brightly colored stripes. Some mines have underground rivers and lakes that can be crossed by boats, and one mine in southern Poland even has ornate rooms carved out of salt. Salting Civilization Everywhere in the world, it has been found that the early humans who survived by eating wild animals and gathering wild edible plants did not have to think about salt. Salt is in their blood and the flesh of animals, so hunters got all the salt they needed. But once people settled in one place and began farming to produce food, they had a great need for salt. Eating vegetables and grains supplied no sodium chloride, so salt had to be obtained from somewhere else. The animals that farmers raised, such as cattle, goats, sheep, and pigs, also needed to be fed salt. It is, though, thr it is th thought that wild animals were first tamed by farmers, offering them salt. Soon these animals would pass their time near people in order to get the salt they needed. Salt Preserves Once farmers formed communities, 
they began to trade and sell the things they produced. For many thousands of years, the most valued item of trade was food. But within refrigeration, but without refrigeration, food spoiled. It was discovered that salt preserved food by killing bacteria and drawing off moisture. Milk and cream could be cured with salt to become cheese. Cabbage could become sauerkraut. Cucumbers could be made into pickles. Meat could become ham or bacon. And fish could become salt fish. Though it is unknown exactly when this was first discovered, it is one of the most significant changes in history. It meant that for the first time, people could journey far from home eating preserved food. In fact, food preserved in salt could be taken hundreds or thousands of miles away to be traded or sold. Hence, when people had a good supply of salt, they could also have a thriving international trade, which in turn led to great power. On every continent in every century, the dominant people were the ones who controlled the salt trade. Today, the largest producers of salt is the United States. Salt Dynasties The ancient Chinese built the first salt empire. The rulers understood the value of salt, so only the govern government was allowed to produce, produce and sell it. The government could then raise the price of salt whenever they needed more money. During the Tang Dynasty, which lasted from 600, 618 to 907, half the money earned by the Chinese government came from salt. Salt paid for the Great Wall of China, which is 1,500 miles long and is still standing today. It also paid for the Chinese army, but people did not like paying such high prices. Throughout Chinese history, rulers became unpopular by overcharging for salt. Soy sauce. Instead of sprinkling salt on their food, the Chinese made soy sauce to get the salt they needed. To make soy sauce, they would steam fresh whole soybeans to soften them, then spread them on a large straw trays. Yeast was added, and the trays were put in dark room until mold formed on top. Next, the beans were mixed with salt and water and stored in, a, in crock jars to ferment for up to a year. Eventually, the bean mush looked like mud. The mixture was filtered through pipes and sterilized with steam, resulting in a dark, salty syrup that could be mixed with water according to taste. Soy sauce. Meals and mummies. The Egyptians were the first to produce salt food on a large scale. The Egyptian people depended on salt fish and meat to survive. When a dry year prevented crops from growing along the green banks of the Nile River, they got their salt from the African desert, out past the Nile. There they found dry lake beds covered with salt that could easily be scraped up. The ancient Egyptians saved salted food for both the living and the dead. Egyptian tombs have been found that, that are filled with your urns of preserved foods that were meant to help the dead on their journey to the underworld. Dead bodies were also cleaned and salted to preserve for eternity. Without salt, there would have been no mummies across the desert. Because salt is bulky, it is usually produced near ports or rivers to be transported by ships. But in the Sahara Desert, huge caravans of camels carried the salt. Large slabs of cone-shaped blocks of salt were wrapped in straw to travel hundreds of miles across the desert. In cities like Timbuktu, the salt would be traded for gold. The power of a good ham. 3,000 years ago, a tribe of people called the Celts mined rock salt in Central Europe. They became powerful by selling salt and salted food along the rivers of Europe. In fact, salt was so important to the Celts, they even named places for salt. 
One town was named Helena, which means salt work. And it was near the city of Salzburg, which means salt town. One of the salt's most famous producers was ham, which was made by salting the thigh of a hog. The best ham was reserved for the Celts, bravest warriors. And if two warriors claimed right to that ham, they would have to fight for it. Even, their, even, even after the Celts lost control of Central Europe and their salt mines were abandoned for centuries, the countries were where they lived became known for their love of ham. Well-preserved miners. In 1573, a strange discovery was made in the Austrian Alps. The perfectly preserved body of a man wearing bright red wool plaid clothing and a cone-shaped felt hat was found lying next to his miner's pickaxe. The brightness of his clothing was shocking because Europeans at the time were not known for dressing in such bright colors. Eventually, scientists concluded he was a Celtic. He was a Celt. Salt miner who got trapped in a collapsed salt mine shaft around 400 BC nearly 2,000 years before. An Empire of Salt For centuries, the Romans ruled the Western world, and from the beginning, salt was a key to their power. Rome's cities were often founded near salt works, and one of the greatest Roman roads, the Via Salataria, or Salt Road, was originally built to bring salt to Rome from the nearby salt works at Ostia. The Romans believed that everyone had the right to salt. Common salt was, was served in a simple seashell in most households or in ornate silver bowls at a wealthy family's feast. Unlike the Chinese emperors, the Roman rulers did not try to own all the salt but only to control the price. To make people happy, Roman leaders tried to keep prices low. Salt was occasionally taxed to raise money for armies, but sometimes Emperor Augustus distributed free salt when he wanted to gain public support for war. Words salted by the Romans. Many English words are based on Roman word of salt, sol. Even the word salt itself Saul is the root word for salary and soldier because Roman soldiers were often paid in salt. This is also the origins of expression, worth his salt and to earn his salt. Salad to comes from isalata, a salt word because Romans ate their greens with a dressing based on salt water. Salt was central to everyday life in the Roman Empire. All along the Mediterranean Sea, Romans produced three highly valued salt products, fish sauce, purple dye, and salt fish. Many kinds of fish were cured in salt, dried, and sold throughout the Western world. A slightly rotten sauce. Would you put a sauce made from fish guts on your food? The Romans made a sauce called garum by placing leftover fish scraps, the innards, the gills, and the tails in earthen jars with salt until they fermented into fishy smelling liquid. The Romans used garum like the Chinese used soy sauce. It was added to food instead of salt, but not everyone loved garum. The, natural, the naturalist Pliny said that it was rotten, and the philosopher Seneca called it expensive liquid of bad fish. The smell of purple. According to legend, people die, people die was discovered, purple, sorry, according to the legend, purple dye was discovered when Hercules took his sheepdog for a walk along the sea. When the dog bit into a small shellfish called Amurix, his mouth turned strange dark color. 
the Roman learned how to produce this purple dye, but it was an extremely expensive process, and only wealthy people and royalty could afford it. Julius Caesar decreed that only he and his household could wear purple trimmed togas, and the sails of Cleopatra's ship were dyed purple. The only problem was that the purple liquid sank. It smelled so bad that when a 19th century chemist identified the purple element, it was named bromine, a word meaning stench. The New Sea After the fall of the Roman Empire, the Mediterranean Sea remained the center of European salt trade. Two small Italian cities, Venice and Genoa, fought for centuries to control the Mediterranean salt. In 1380, Venice defeated Genoa and remained dominant for, the, for a century. But then something happened. At the time, Venetian merchants like Marco Polo would have to travel huge distances over land, eating lots of salt, lots of salt food along the way to get valuable silks and spices from Asia. But in 1488, a Portuguese sea captain named Bartholomew Diaz found a faster and cheaper way to get those precious goods. He sailed from Portugal around the southern tip of Africa and into the Indian Ocean. With Diaz's journal, journey, the great age of exploration had begun. Nations on the Atlantic Ocean, such as Portugal, Spain, France, Holland, and England, suddenly saw a chance to shift power from the Mediterranean Sea to their Atlantic ports. They sent out explorers like Christopher Columbus and John Cabot to the New World and greatly expanded world trade in furs and codfish, both of which had to be salted for shipping. Salt Allies. By the 16th century, Northern countries like England, Holland, and those in Scandinavia were catching more and more fish for hungry European market. In fact, from the 16th to the 18th century, 60% of all the fish eaten in Europe was codfish, while much of the remaining 40% was herring. All the fish needed to be cured with salt, both for taste and so that it could travel across Europe. But there was a problem. Salt was harder to get than fish. Only Southern European, only Southern European, only Southern Europe had enough sun and dry weather to make the sea salt that was ideal for salting fish. And so alliances were made and trade organizations formed between the countries with the fish and the countries with the salt. The English made a treaty with the Portuguese, and many northern countries bought salt from a German trade organization known as Hesiandic League. Preserving Justice The Egyptians were not the last people to preserve their dead with salt. In the 1600s, conditions in French prisons were so bad that many prisoners died before they could be brought to trial. So, they were preserved in salt and kept until their court date. One famous story was that of Maurice Lecour. He had died in prison and his body was preserved in salt. But French justice could be notoriously slow. After seven years, poor Monsignor Lecour still had no trial date. Finally, the case was dropped and Monsignor Lecour was buried. Salt and Liberté Even as the salt trade became more international, rulers still used salt to raise money in their own countries. In France, King Louis Louis XIV raised taxes on salt for many of his subjects. Soon enough, people began smuggling salt illegally to avoid taxes. It was smuggled across rivers at night hidden in shipments of salt fish, and even concealed by women in their undergarments. An entire branch of police was formed to stop salt smugglers, 
and by the late 18th century, 3,000 French men, women, and children were arrested every year for salt-related crimes. Some were even sentenced to death. The Ship of State The royal tables of France were set with huge ornate salt dispensers called nifs. Nif is an old French word for ship, and these model ships were made with precious metals. The nif was always placed on the table near the king, since it was also a symbol of the ship of state. To the French, the salt in the nif symbolizes preservation and good health, and that the stability of the state depended on the health of the king. The nif also sometimes contained a small drawer for an antidote to poison, helping the king to stay healthy in more than one way. North America, North America's shortcoming. Before the European colonists came, the Americans followed the same pattern as other countries or other continents. The Aztecs in Mexico, the Mayans in Central America, the Incas in Peru, and the Chibia in Colombia were all dominant, civiliz- dominant civilizations who controlled the salt trade. When they lost their power, they also lost control of salt. When the British arrived in North America, they tried to control the salt trade too. In 1607, Captain John Smith established the colony of Jamestown in Virginia and started a salt work. In 1660, the Dutch started a salt work for their colony of New Amsterdam by, by granting the right to make salt on a small island nearby, today known as Coney Island. New Englanders were becoming wealthy, trading cod and furs, while Virginia's hams were becoming famous. However, most of the salt the colonists used was bought was bought from the British colonies in the Caribbean or directly from England, England's main salt work in Liverpool. When America declared its independence from England, their salt supply was suddenly cut off. George Washington's army lacked salt to make gunpowder, to preserve food for, mar- for marches, to maintain horses, or to heal wounds. Immediately, the Continental Congress had to start paying rewards to colonists to establish salt works and soon America had its own supply of salt. Salting America After the Revolutionary War, America began began to grow, and transporting salt to the new territories became a problem. So a system of canals was built, starting with the Erie Canal, which connected Lake Erie with the Hudson River. Now there was a waterway to move salt up and down the Hudson, uh, up and down the Hudson, either to the Atlantic Ocean or the Great Lakes, and the rapidly growing Midwest. Meatpacking became a major industry in the Midwest, and like the fisheries of the East Coast, it required huge quantities of salt. American roads. If you study a road map of anywhere in the North America, it often looks as though there was no plan to the placement of towns and roads. That's because many roads were simply widened trails originally cut by animals looking for salt. People followed these trails and decided the places that that had salt at the end of the trails were good locations to start villages. A wide road near Lake Erie was made by buffalo, and the salt lick found at the end of of it became the city of Buffalo, New York. Salt and Science As modern science changed the way people lived, salt's role began to change too. In the early 19th century, a Frenchman named Nicolas Aperti discovered that food could be preserved in airtight jars that were heated. This led to canning, which greatly decreased the market for salt fish and vegetables. 100 years later, Clarence Birdseye discovered how to preserve food by rapid freezing and started a frozen food company. 
At the same time, scientists had learned that salt could be broken down into its elements. It was made from sodium and chloride. Both of these had main industry uses. New salt-based industry industries were launched, including bleach, pharmaceuticals, new explosives, and bicarbonate of soda, which is used to make soft drinks. Ketchup. In the 17th and 18th centuries, a sauce made from salt anchovies became extremely popular. Salted anchovies became extremely popular. In England, it was known as ketchup or ketchup. The name came from an Indonesian fish sauce called kipap, ikan. By 19th century, there were many different kinds of ketchup. Some had fish or mushrooms or other ingredients, but every recipe contained salt. Tomato ketchup was an American idea. The first published recipe for tomato ketchup was written in 1812 by a prominent Philadelphia doctor named James Meese, who referred to tomatoes by an old name, Love Apples. Hmm. Slice the th apples thin and over each other, sprinkle a little salt, cover them, let them lie 24 hours, then beat them w well and simmer them half an hour in bell metal kettle. Add mace and allspice. When cold, add two cloves of raw shallot, cut small, and half a gill of brandy to each bottle, which must be corked tight and kept in a cool place. The Salt March While salt's economic uses changed with time, salt's symbolic power held strong. Perhaps the most famous story of salt's power was Gandhi's Salt March. For centuries, the British had ruled India. In 1930, the Indian, Na Indian National Congress met to discuss ways to gain independence. A small named Mohandas Karmanchi Gandhi, who's, who was known by his nickname Mahatma, which means the great soul, believed that the way to popularize their cause was through salt. At first, this seemed like a particular, this seemed like a particular idea, but Gandhi explained that the average Indian was angry because the British had banned the local manufacturers of salt. They forced Indians to buy salt from Liverpool at very high prices. Not only had this left the people in salt producing areas without a means to earn a living, but it also made salt expensive. On March 12th, 1930, Gandhi announced to India's India, British and American newspapers, that he intended to walk 240 miles to Dandi on the Arabian Sea, where he would defy British law by making salt. He started with 78 followers. By the time he reached the Arabian Sea, 25 days later, thousands had joined the march, including journalists from all around the world. With his spindly bare legs, Gandhi walked along the beach where a thick crust of salt had evaporated in the sun and picked up a piece. Someone shouted, Hail Deliverer! Gandhi had made salt in defiance of British law, and people celebrated throughout India. They too gathered salt along India's coastline and demonstrated in the cities. It was the beginning of a movement which 17 years later led to Indian independence. How Salt Lost Its Glitter For centuries, geologists were fascinated by what were known by what were known as salt domes. While most underground salt is mined from large, shallow beds spread over a wide area, occasionally salt becomes compressed into columns that grow several miles deep into the earth. The top of the dome then pushes right up to the surface, forming a slightly rounded hill with a thin layer of topsoil. Until the 20th century, nobody knew how deep these domes were because drills could not go very far into the earth. In 1859, Edwin Drake was able to drill 69.5 feet on the edge of a salt dome in Tuttonsville, Pennsylvania. Even more significantly, through geologist 
had said he would fail, Drake discovered oil in the dome. Then, in 1901, Patabillo Higgins and Anthony Lucas again ignored the geologist and drilled into the edge of a salt dome in Texas, known as Spindle Top. A tall black fountain of oil erupted. Scientists learned that the salt crystals in salt domes joined together to form an impenetrable grass-like wall. When other organic materials gets trapped next to the dome, it slowly decomposes over millions of years and eventually turns into oil and gas. After spindle top, no one ever looked at salt domes or drilling the same way again. Drills and rigs became the tools of the oil industry. New drilling technology made it possible to understand what was really under the Earth's surface. And soon it was discovered that salt, far from being rare, is distributed in huge beds throughout the planet. What were once thought to be isolated salt areas were eventually part of enormous underground salt deposits that, stre for th that stretched for thousands of miles. In the United States, one bed covers the entire Great Lakes region. Another bed begins in eastern France and goes through Germany, Austria, and southern Poland. And so today, when we put salt on our food, we barely give it a second thought. We live in a time when salt is taken for granted. It's common, inexpensive, and hardly worth fighting over. But the next time you pick up a salt shaker, remember that not only do you need to salt to live, you are holding rocks that shape the history of the world.